What up? This is Rama Screen, and in the anticipation of High Ground, which arrives in on digital and on demand May 14th, I'm here talking with the director of this new film, Stephen Maxwell Johnson. How are you, Stephen? I'm really good, thank you. Lovely to meet you, Rama. Oh, lovely to meet you as well. So this project marks your feature directorial debut, correct? Look, it's actually, I have made another film in Arnhem Land uh, prior to this called Young Boy, but this has been, you know, 20 years in the making. It's been a, a big journey, this, this particular project. And um, yep, it's uh, finished. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you ever do finish. So I'm um, curious, what drew you to Chris's script and what made you want to be involved with High Ground? Okay, well, look, it's, it's not really that, that, that's not actually quite how it happened. It's not mm. as simple as that. Essentially, this, I grew up in Arnhem Land with the people. It was my life story, um, those connections, those relationships I was adopted in. And it's what I've seen and listened to over the years. And basically, uh, Chris is a very dear friend. I brought Chris up, in, up to Arnhem Land. We sat and talked and listened for, for 20 years with families right across and essentially the, the story was sort of sung to us, spoken to us. We've, I've grown up with these stories all my life and it was all about it's time that we, we this great untold story about our history was, was told. It is the oldest living culture on earth and um, it's fascinating, um, you know, just that deep human connection these people have to earth, they are earth, there is no disconnection, it is one cycle of life and um, to sort of be immersed in that and to create through that and with that um, over a, 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 period, a long period of time has been a, an incredible journey. So the script was really born through those relationships and all of that research and learning and listening and watching and dancing and singing and so it's very much their story. It's a both ways story. You know, we, we, we try to find balance in the storytelling to flip it, to put a young bidding warrior in the, the, the leading role and to see, see the story from a different perspective and to immerse the audience in country and, and into the, the language of the bush and the, the sounds of nature. Um, so yeah, that was the, the journey. So it wasn't really just a case we had this script that we thought about and went out and did it. It was born of the earth and of the people ultimately. And, and we worked very, very closely together to, to write it and create it. And uh, uh, yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I was born and raised in Indonesia. So Australia is my neighbor, but I've never been to Australia before. I've always wanted to go there. It's on my bucket list. As an Indonesian, I was like, ah, oh, I keep missing out on that. So where exactly in Australia did you guys shoot this film? And logistically, what were the challenges that came with uh, shooting this film entirely uh, out in the wild? Okay, cool. Wild's good. It is one of the last great wildernesses in the world and certainly in Australia. It's called Arnhem Land. It's in North Australia, right at the top of North Australia mm. to the east of Darwin. It's uh, an area that was kind of established uh, back in time to stop the slaughter of Yulngu and Binning people and they sent the missionaries in. So it sort of became this kind of protected zone in some ways and it's mm. stayed that way it's a vast area of land it's absolutely stunningly beautiful it's untouched um you know rangers now and and family look after the land in traditional ways it's a, a beautiful part of the world and 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 families are still practicing semi-traditional lifestyle in certain areas and hunting and gathering and and ceremony is still taking place the art the singing, the dancing, it's all alive. Um, it is rapidly disappearing, as you know, uh, language is culture, uh, language is dying, um, as some of the old, old people pass away because unfortunately it's not been passed on. Um, and part of you know our story is about trying to sort of uh, create those heroes, create that pride in language and culture again for young people, um, you know, through the very powerful medium of, of filmmaking and um, you know recreate those mythologies in a way so that uh, hopefully there's this generation of young people who grow up and feel very proud that they speak their own language and they know how to make spears they have those skills and that knowledge because it's something we all should really be connected and learn from I mean language and culture should be in our education systems I mean it's the oldest connection we have to human life on this planet and therefore it's the, the ultimate way to think about looking after the planet. Let's let's dive into that then, uh, because this movie 
tackles um, uh, issues of colonialism and racism. And so when you cast the, you know, the locals in, in, this, in these roles, how do you approach filming those scenes in a way that's sensitive and respectful to them? Okay, beautiful. Once again, um, it's uh, a both ways project. It's such a beautiful collaboration because of um, the connections I, I have with all the families up there. Mm. But we were, you know, given access through the old people to, to, to sacred places, country that was, hasn't been filmed on before, that was directly connected to the storytelling in the sense that incidents had taken place in various places. Um, uh, so there was a lot of work put into finding those deep connections with country and where we shot the film and, uh, you know, what time of day we shot the film, certain things we're allowed to see, not allowed to show. So wow. it was a, quite a, a, a very intricate process. Every sound, every bug, every thing in the film is placed on country appropriately, you know, in, in post-production, if there was a little frog or a cricket that wasn't supposed to be in that scene, it was taken out. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's all about the detail. It's all about that truth telling in, on every level uh, for the old people. It's about getting it right and kind of putting, putting something out there that was honest um, about, you know, what, what has happened and, and that connection, that, that kind of dreaming story, really. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Simon Baker is also one of the executive producers on this project. And so uh, was he on board uh, prior to, I mean, like uh, how, how was he involved in the equation, the whole thing? Okay, well, Simon is a, a very old friend of mine and we hadn't seen each other for many, many, many years. And we recon reconnected at a big uh, festival in Arnhem Land, Arnhem Land called the Garma Festival, which happens each year. And I hadn't seen Simon for a long time and we were almost ready to go. Simon had all, all, always been on my hit list for the character of Travis, but he was working on The Mentalist all those years. He was away, he was away, and he hadn't long been back in Australia. And he would saw me at this festival, he called out, I turned around, I took one look at Simon, and I just said, he's, he's here, Travis is here, amazing. So we just, we started talking and si uh, Simon has, um, uh, had been been up at the festival and found a deep connection with the culture and was really feeling country and being deeply affected by the whole experience of being up in Arnhem Land and um, he just it was almost like a natural progression for him to become involved in this story and uh, you know he does the most amazing thing on screen and his connection and the way that he worked with Jacob Jr. Nay Ingle who plays Gudjuk the lead character in the film is just nothing it's just beautiful it's real the, the on-screen and off-screen relationship between those two men is what you see it's truthful there was learning happening on both sides Jacob had never acted in his life before and there's a lovely story about Jacob I'd spoken to his grandfather some 25 years earlier about the idea of telling the story of the resistance and that his that old man and other old men had all agreed that they would uh give access and, and do everything within their power to tell that story because it was all about truth telling and putting the real history on the screen. And during the course of many, many years, the 25 years, 20 years to make this film, uh, Jacob was born and he grew up and uh, he, when I was out there doing all the screen tests, he jumped in front of the camera and put a spear to my neck and basically looked into my eyes and he was the one he was like the chosen one it's almost like his grandfather had sung him all the way through to play the part in this film um you know his grandfather's since passed away but his legacy lives on and uh, it's quite a beautiful beautiful thing that his grandson got to be the lead actor in a story he wanted to tell so uh finally um here in america there's always this ongoing friction or um constant brainstorming as to what we can do to uh, kind of like a repair relationship with the, the Native Americans, considering the history of uh, how America with the Native Americans have been in the past over the years, the genocide and the violence and whatnot. So uh, I'm just wondering in terms of Australia, what, what has Australia done government wise uh, in terms of, uh, you know, mending that relationship with the, uh, with the natives and the locals uh, because of the history of the past as well? Yeah, sure. Look, <clears throat> it's all about ignorance. Um, the, the, 
when you say what have they done they haven't done enough simply what has been done has often been wrong i mean all you know in the in the film we you know there are it's all about that missed opportunity the mistakes are making on both sides of the fence and as we move forward really it begins with education it begins with respect it begins with land and we've got to simply understand that connection that we all have to the earth and to the land and that Yungu culture, Bini culture, Aboriginal culture in this country, the oldest human connection to planet earth that is still alive. We should be celebrating that, learning from that, educating ourselves with that. It's an important part of being human and we need to see it that way and, and we should be protecting it, looking after it, nurturing it and respecting it as part of who we all are, not treating it as something over there and um, something we don't care about. Let's just push it away, push it away. We don't need to feel guilty about things that have happened. We need to accept it, move on and embrace the day and be lucky that we still have language. We still have the songs. We still have the oldest art on, on earth. And there's a lot to take from that. Um, you know, in these times of COVID and these times of climate change, which has always been happening. However, there are ways of reading that, reading nature, working with nature and thinking about all of those things that um, is, has been done for thousands and thousands and thousands of years by human beings. And um, why wouldn't we kind of uh, uh, take from that and work with that and want to learn from that? Excellent. Uh, thank you for sharing that. For my fans at home, everybody go check out High Ground, arriving on digital and on demand May 14th. Stephen, thank you for talking to me and congratulations. Absolute pleasure. Lovely to talk to you. What are you going to put on that screen behind you? Oh, maybe Australia Outback. No, I'm just Fantastic. <laughs> get, get a shot out of the movie. That'll be it. <laughs>